I'm now going to go on to Hume's faculty psychology. Now, in the early parts of the treatise especially, you will find Hume referring to faculties a lot of the time. And this can be very confusing for a number of reasons. First of all, he tends to use different words for the same faculty. So he will talk about reason, the understanding. Are they the same or different? The imagination, the fancy. Again, are they the same or different? This kind of thing can be very confusing when you come to read Hume for the first time. It can actually be confusing even if you're rather familiar with Hume. What I want to do is to talk through uh, what I've discovered about his faculty psychology. This is based on a pretty systematic investigation of his use of faculty terms throughout the treatise. And my hope is that by presenting to you uh, the results of that investigation, you will be better able to read the early parts of the treatise and understand what's going on. So let's look at some of those early passages and see the distinctions that Hume draws. Well, at Treatise 112, that's Book 1, Part 1, Section 2, so very early on, he distinguishes between impressions of sensation and impressions of reflection. So we have there a basic distinction between sensation and reflection. In the next section, he distinguishes between ideas of the memory and imagination. Now, <clears throat> you might think that this is not going to be tremendously important. I mean, ideas of memory, well, that means they're ideas that we are obviously remembering in a fixed order. Ideas of the imagination, we have more freedom. We can mix and match those. But is this of any great significance for understanding Hume's philosophy? Well, we see some of the significance in the big famous arguments for which Hume is best known. So the first quotation there is from the famous section on induction, where Hume is setting up his discussion of induction and giving the agenda for what follows. The next question is whether experience produces the idea by means of the understanding or imagination, whether we are determined by reason to make the transition, or by association of perceptions. So here what he's saying is, when we make an inductive inference, an inference from past to future, for example, we've seen one billiard ball hit another billiard ball, and the second one move, we've seen that again and again and again. We see a billiard ball moving towards another, and we expect the second one to move. So from the impression of the usual cause, we get a lively idea of the usual effect. We're expecting that effect to come about. And here, Hume is posing the question, which faculty is it that leads us to do that? Is it the understanding or the imagination? Is it the reason, or is it association of perceptions? Now, straight away, that sheds some light on Hume's uh, notion of these faculties. He seems to be equating the understanding with reason, he seems to be treating the imagination as a faculty that has to do with association of ideas. That is correct. That is giving uh, an appropriate impression of Hume's use here. But you can see that his, his, the way in which he poses this question suggests that this is going to be absolutely central to understanding his conclusion. The second quotation there is from Hume's discussion of the external world of scepticism with regard to the senses. So here another very famous one of Hume's arguments. Uh, what is it that leads us to believe in the continued and distinct existence of body? Why do be we believe that there are physical things outside us that continue to exist even when we're not perceiving them? And again, he's setting the agenda. So this is right at the beginning of the section. The subject then of our present inquiry is concerning the causes which induce us to believe in the existence of body. We shall consider whether it be the senses, reason, or the imagination 
that produces the opinion of a continued or of a distinct existence. And after having set the agenda in that way, his discussion continues accordingly. Uh, he looks to see whether it's the senses that produce this opinion. No, it's not them. Looks at reason. No, it's not reason. Well, then it must be the imagination, and here's how the imagination does it. So again, we get a major discussion of Hume's philosophy being couched in terms of which faculty is responsible for some crucial mental operation. Again, with morality, it's a bit less explicit here, but the same thing is essentially going on. So this is right from the beginning of uh, book three of the treatise, the first section of book three, where he's discussing the origin of morality. We need only consider whether it be possible from reason alone to distinguish betwixt moral good and evil, or whether there must concur some other principles to enable us to make that distinction. And here at the beginning of the moral inquiry, the uh, inquiry concerning the principles of morals, which was published in 1751, there's been a controversy started of late concerning the general foundation of morals, whether they be derived from reason or from sentiment. Okay, so we've seen there three of the most famous positions for which Hume is known. Uh, concerning induction, concerning the external world, concerning morals. And all of them are phrased in terms of which faculty is responsible for a particular operation. Now, you might expect that it would be fairly straightforward, given the importance that Hume accords to these faculties, to get clear on what he means by them all. Actually, it's not very straightforward at all. In particular, the relation between reason and the imagination is quite tricky to untangle, and we'll be talking about that in a lecture or two when we come to induction. What I'm going to do now is, as a preliminary, give you an outline of the theory of faculties which seems to be implicit in the treatise. And I'm tr going to try to avoid saying things that are too controversial and just go by the faculties he refers to and what he says about them. So <clears throat> here is an enumeration of the faculties that Hume seems to endorse. Well, first of all, we've got the external senses. So the senses, the familiar five senses, the, their function seems to be to, be, to impre uh, present impressions to the mind. So as we've seen, ideas are copied from impressions. What the external senses do is present visual or tactile or whatever impressions to the mind, and we get ideas that copy them. Reflection, we've seen, is an internal sense. And as I've mentioned before, Hume seems to put together two different kinds of reflection that perhaps he ought to have distinguished. And one is feeling, getting, for example, a feeling of heat or anger, whereby I derive ideas of those sorts of things. And another one is being aware, monitoring what's going on in my mind. He puts those together under the heading of reflection. Most of the time when he talks about impressions of reflection, he means passions, desires, that sort of thing. And we've seen that he talks about the memory. And the function of the memory is to replay our ideas, and it does so vivaciously. So when Hume distinguishes between the memory and the imagination, there are two big distinctions. One of them, as we've seen, is that the memory replays our ideas in the same order as the original. So when we're remembering things, ideas come back to our mind in a similar order as the impressions came. So when we see an event happening, A followed by B followed by C, our memory will replay those ideas in the same order. And it will do so vivaciously. We're going to come across force and vivacity quite a lot uh, in what follows. And one of the things that Hume wants to say is that when we get ideas of the memory, when we feel, ah, that's something that happened, that's a more vivacious, a stronger idea than if we just imagine the same thing happening. So that brings us to the imagination. And Hume uses the word fancy indistinguishably. So it, it, just for elegant variation. Sometimes he will talk about the imagination. Sometimes he will talk about the fancy. Uh, quite often, he will simply alternate between the two within the same sentence. 
So be aware of that. When you come across the word the fancy, that really is just another word for the imagination. The imagination, unlike the memory, has freedom to change around our ideas. You know, we can think of a unicorn by taking the idea of a horn and the idea of a horse. Even though we've never had the impression of those together, our Im imagination has the freedom to transpose them. But those ideas, as a result, are less vivacious. They don't strike us with the force of belief. When I imagine a unicorn, uh, that, that isn't as though I remember having seen one. It's quite different. Oh, sorry. Let's go back. So that brings us to reason, which Hume also calls the understanding. And I will uh, give some textual support for that in a moment. Now, understanding what Hume means by reason is very difficult and very controversial. What I'm going to suggest for the moment is we take it to be something like the overall cognitive faculty. That is the faculty by which we discover and judge truth and falsehood. And that goes along with seeing Hume using the word the understanding as equivalent. So when he talks about, when he gives a title to book one of the treatise, Of the Understanding, he's talking there about our general cognitive faculty, which embraces all the various methods we have of discovering what is the case. At least, that's what it seems to be. But you can see that that causes a bit of a problem. Because when Hume asks whether a particular opinion is derived from reason or not, he seems to be using reason in a rather narrower way. So there's a bit of a problem in understanding exactly what the scope of reason is here. Is he using the word ambiguously? Most Hume scholars have thought that he is. But for the moment, at any rate, let's take reason in that broad sense as meaning the understanding, our overall cognitive faculty. And contrast that with the will, the cognitive faculty, which forms intentions in response to desires and passions. So we have this traditional distinction between reason, or the understanding, and the will. And one of those is used to discover things about the world. The other forms intentions and acts upon them. Here are some quotations which could be used to back up this general uh, thought of reason as being the cognitive faculty. We get reason is the discovery of truth or falsehood. Now that occurs in his discussion of morality. So what Hume is wanting to argue here is that morality is not a matter of discovery of truth and falsehood. What he's going to say in brief is that moral judgments motivate us. They have a cognitive element. They lead us to act. Whereas mere discovery of fact can't do that. Therefore, reason cannot be responsible for moral distinctions. And you can see that it fits perfectly into that sort of argument to start off by saying reason is the discovery of truth and falsehood. That faculty by which we discern truth and falsehood, the understanding. That's a, a footnote that was in the first two editions of Hume's inquiry, uh, 1748 and 1750. It was removed later, but... Um, not, I think, because of any change of view. Uh, I th he simply removed a reference to some other philosophers that had been there. The dissertation on the passions. So that's a few years later. Reason in a strict sense as meaning the judgment of truth and falsehood. So again, we've got something very similar to what we saw in book three of the treatise. And there are lots of other passages that could be mentioned. So we've got Quite a few from the treatise there. Uh, M is the moral inquiry, and M app is the appendix here, the first appendix to the moral inquiry. What about reason and understanding? And bear in mind, this is a controversial claim. Uh, Don Garrett, David Owen, for example, would want to deny this. But I think there's very strong evidence that Hume is using reason and the understanding as completely equivalent. Take, for example, this passage, again from the discussion of induction. 
When the mind makes an inductive inference, it is not determined by reason, but by certain principles which associate together the ideas of these objects and unite them in the imagination. Had ideas no more union in the fancy than objects seem to have to the understanding, we wouldn't be able to make uh, those inferences. Now, it seems absolutely clear there that the, the term the fancy is being used as mere elegant variation for the imagination. And there's plenty of other passages where he does this. And I think it's equally clear that he's using the understanding as elegant variation for reason. They seem to be referring to one and the same thing. And again, there's a host of other passages uh, where he does this. I think a particularly striking one is the footnote that you find in book two of the treatise, 2276. Um, Hume actually gave instructions for this footnote to be removed, but it remained uh, by mistake in uh, the treatise. He wanted to replace it with a longer footnote, which he reworded, and that's in treatise 13919, so that's in book one of the treatise. So we have a footnote being reworded. And in the first one, he said, by the understanding, I understand, blah, blah, blah. And he, gave, he was explaining what he meant by the understanding. Now, that's obviously a bit inelegant, by the understanding, I understand. He reworded it, by reason, I understand. Very strong evidence that for Hume, the two terms are being used completely equivalently. Now, here are various passages which I shan't go through in detail. I've simply listed them. These are all passages where Hume explicitly talks about faculties. So he uses the word faculty or faculties and distinguishes the various faculties from each other, either explicitly or implicitly, but nevertheless clearly. And that, I think, serves to support the itemization that I've given of the various faculties that Hume recognizes. Um, he never distinguishes between reason and the understanding. He never distinguishes between reason or the understanding and the judgment. I think that's significant. Also, there's an important footnote uh, in Treatise 1375 where Hume actually says it's a mistake to distinguish between the different parts of the understanding. He wants to say uh, that conception and judgment and reason all ultimately reduced to the same thing. So it would seem rather strange if he were drawing fine distinctions within the understanding between judgment and reason and so forth. Again, there is potential controversy here. I'm simply giving you the results of what I've tried to make a fairly objective investigation into the language that Hume uses in the treatise. Now let's take a look at that in the context, the historical context set by two predecessors. Well, one predecessor, one contemporary really. Now John Locke talks about faculties but expresses some anti-realism about them. So he actually suggests that talking about faculties is a source of error. I mean, when you talk about the human understanding, it sounds like there's something in you that understands. And he says, no, that's not right. When we talk about the human understanding, all we mean is our capacity to understand. That's all. The faculty of reason is not a, it's not a separate thing that reasons. It's our reasoning capacity. And he actually suggests maybe it would be better to do away entirely with faculty words because they're so misleading. But he says, they're so much in fashion, it look, looks like too much affectation wholly to lay them by. So it would be a bit pretentious. It would seem um, very unconventional not to use faculty language, given how common it is. But we do need to watch out for this error. We mustn't think of the faculties as distinct agents. And when we refer to the faculties, it looks like Locke is not really making a big deal about it. The understanding or reason, whichever your lordship pleases to call it. He's not making a big deal as to whether we call a particular thing the understanding or the reason. 
Now, we'll see later that Hume also has some negative things to say about faculty language. When he talks about the ancient philosophers, uh, this is treatise 143, he has dismissive things to say about faculties. And indeed, given Hume's background, uh, the fact that he's, as it were, he's empiricist, so he's not going to think that we can, as it were, look in ourselves and intrinsically discover the parts of the mind by a priori reasoning. Uh, he's generally metaphysically rather modest. You wouldn't expect that he would be a big fan of faculties um, in the light of Locke's sceptical view of them. On the other hand, let's look at Francis Hutcheson. Now, Francis Hutcheson is, he was probably the most famous philosopher in Scotland and the most influential at the time that Hume was writing. He was already a major figure. Hume sent the treatise to Hutcheson for comments, or at least he sent uh, book three of the treatise in draft form to Hutcheson to get comments on it. This was in 1740. He was sent the first two volumes of the treatise, which had been published in 1739, uh, by a friend of Hume's, so he had those as well. Now, it's rather intriguing that in 1742, that's two years after seeing Hume's draft of the treatise, Hutchison, in three different works, added comments about the faculties. So, it's not absolutely clear which way the influence goes here. We've got Hutchison, an older contemporary of Hume, Maybe Hume discovered about faculty language from Hutchison. Maybe he took it on from the milieu in which they were both working. Or just possibly Hutchison's comments on the faculties in 1742 are intended to be a corrective to what he had found in Hume. It's possible. We just don't know. Writers on these subjects should remember the common division of the faculties of the soul. Now, is that saying to Hume you should have remembered the common division of the faculties of the soul and taken note of it. Well, maybe. There is reason, presenting the natures and relations of things, antecedently to any act of will or desire. And secondly, there's the will. The disposition of soul to pursue what is presented as good and to shun evil. Below these, the ancients, and we should follow them, place two other powers dependent on the body the senses effectively and the passions. And the senses answer to the understanding and the latter, that is the passions, answer to the will. <coughs> now if you take a look on the blue handout that I've given you, what you'll see at the top left is a diagram of what I call Hume's apparent faculty structure. And I've put in brackets draft. And that's not a draft because I'm going to be working on this further and telling you something different. It's because there are quite a lot of things there that are left undetermined and which are potentially controversial. In particular, you can see that I've put the intellectual faculty, the understanding or reason or judgment, on a level with the imagination. No lines between them. I'm not implying any sort of hierarchy. If you look at the diagram below, that is the taxonomy of the faculties implied by um, what Hutchinson's, Hutchinson's written up uh, on the passage there and filled out by a work, another work he published in 1742. And I think it's fair to say that this gives the view of the faculties, the general view of the faculties, of those to whom Hume was writing. So we'll find that Hume has a rather an unconventional view of reason and the imagination. Sorting out the relation between those becomes very thorny and pretty essential for sorting out what he means when he's discussing, for example, induction. But the people he's addressing would have taken the view pretty much as Hutchison sketches it. So the faculties divide in two. You've got the cognitive realm and the cognitive realm. You've got reason, which, in Hutchison's words, perceives and judges the deliverances of the other faculties, 
to discover the natures and relations of things. So that's how we discover what is the case. On the other hand, we've got the conative realm, the realm of the will, and that's what decides on action depending on our desires and passions. Now notice that Hutchison puts subordinate to the reason. He talks about them reporting to reason. Four faculties which I've put down there as ratiocination, imagination, memory, and senses. Okay, now three of those are familiar from Hume. Imagination, memory, and the senses. They all seem fairly straightforward. What's this other one, ratiocination? Well, <clears throat> notice that Hutchison is drawing a distinction between the faculty of reason, the overall cognitive faculty, and the faculty of ratiocination. Ratiocination is a matter of taking your ideas and putting them in order so that you can see the connections between them. So ratiocination, if you like, is the faculty of argument, of reasoning, step-by-step -step reasoning. And one of the faculties that we have is to organize complex ideas in a sequence so that we can see their connections. And Hutchison clearly has the view of reason as something that looks down on, if you like, um, <coughs> surveys these other cognitive faculties, these lesser faculties that report to reason, and reason makes a judgment based on what these faculties present. Okay, now look at the diagram at the top right. Hutchison is distinctive from most other authors in drawing a much more sophisticated um, structure underneath the senses. So where Hume just distinguishes between the ex external senses and um, reflection, you can see that Hutchison draws a distinction between the external senses and internal sense, what he calls consciousness, and reflexive sensation. And under the reflexive sensation, he places a number of different further senses. An aesthetic sense, sympathy, that is fellow feeling for others, uh, a sense of the fitting and the good, and a sense of humor. So Hutchison is treating all of these as cognitive. And when we discuss Hume on morality, which we will do briefly, because uh, we've seen that's extremely relevant to Hume's overall uh, philosophy and his view of the faculties, Hume is going to dispute with Hutchison whether discovery of moral distinctions actually belongs in the realm of reason. He's going to say, actually, it doesn't. Uh, it comes from a notion of taste, which is an interesting amalgam of the two halves. Okay, so I hope that when you read Hume referring to the various faculties, you'll now be able to see how the terms he's using relate to the understanding of those terms of his contemporaries. Uh, but you will nevertheless find some of what he says quite puzzling. Um, I hope that puzzle will be alleviated uh, in a lecture or two when we come to discuss Hume on induction.